Well, good morning and welcome everyone to sign out with the professor. Uh, we're going to be sharing some interesting cases today from the uh, GI tract. Um, and uh, I regret that I'm not able to do this uh, session live due to a family circumstance. And so I hope that you're able to uh, catch this uh, uh, virtually. And I apologize that we won't be able to answer questions live. But I will uh, field questions and answers, uh, uh, provide answers uh, on the uh, uh, video presentation. So, uh, so let's get started with that. And uh, to begin, we'll uh, go to uh, the cases. So here's our first uh, biopsy. Uh, these are obviously a small endoscopic biopsies, as most of our cases will be today. Um, and uh, I like to first try to get a sense for where we are. Uh, looking at this uh, low magnification, um, I think you can see we have sort of a slightly undulating surface. We have some uh, blue cells here in the background. And maybe you can pick out even at low magnification here, we've got a few areas that look sort of a, a variegated blue and pink. So that says to me that we're dealing with uh, gastric uh, uh, oxyntic mucosa. And as we come into higher magnification, indeed, uh, that proves to be the case. We can see here uh, this nice mixture of chief and parietal cells uh, in this sample. Now, notice here that uh, these uh, biopsies are pretty uh, skinny. They're, they're thin. The, there's not a really uh, a robust amount of this uh, parietal epithelium. So that should right away alert us to the possibility that this is uh, a, an atrophic uh, pattern, uh, either an elderly patient who's uh, sort of uh, atrophying as they age, or uh, as in this situation, as we can see, there's some associated uh, lymphoid inflammation uh, we might begin to think that this is a pattern of atrophic chronic gastritis. Uh, so those are some of the clues at low magnification that can help you to uh, come to that diagnosis. Now, what are the other things that could establish that diagnosis? Well, here we can see there's certainly atrophy. Here's the muscularis mucosa. Here's the surface. And usually you would expect this uh, uh, oxyntic mucosa to be uh, probably four or five times as thick as we see it here in, in this sample. Uh, so that's one clue that there is definitely atrophy. Uh, additionally, the inflammatory changes here are not um, uh, associated with any degree of uh, active inflammation within the foveolar epithelium. So we don't see the intraepithelial uh, inflammatory cells here in this foveolar epithelium which we might see if this were damaged due to helicobacter, for example. Uh, and of course, we likewise do not see any organisms within the uh, uh, luminal spaces. Now, the last uh, clue, of course, that we might look for is uh, that of intestinalization or metaplastic changes. Um, and that's not uh, very prominent here. Uh, but <clears throat> in fact, as we look a little bit further, uh, I believe there is uh, one focus where, yep, sure enough, right here, we see those telltale uh, goblet cells making their appearance here uh, in the stomach. So this nicely confirms the fact that this is uh, an atrophic chronic gastritis with secondary intestinal metaplasia. Now, of course, this is one of the factors that makes this a potentially premalignant uh, change as this Metaplastic change can be the harbinger of uh, dysplasia and eventually neoplasia in these uh, patients. But I think a very nice example of uh, chronic atrophic gastritis. <clears throat> As you know, of course, this is associated with uh, uh, intrinsic factor deficiency and B12 uh, deficiency, therefore, uh, potentially uh, macrocytic anemias, uh, as well as uh, neoplasia. So a nice uh, case to start out our examples here. Let's go on to the next case uh, with that. Again, we're dealing with uh, small biopsies. Uh, we may wonder kind of where we are. Uh, this time, let's look here on the far right uh, and see, uh, it looks as though we may have a degree of uh, uh, villus type architecture here. Um, 
And uh, as we can see, a few little uh, prominent uh, villa st structures here. Um, but notice also we have this uh, uh, very uh, pink hyaline material here. So we're in the small bowel. We've got intestinal type of uh, epithelium with goblet cells and so forth. But here we have a villus that is uh, distorted to some degree by um, an infiltrative uh, process. Uh, notice it's very uh, uh, seemingly vasculocentric. Here we've got some vessels. Uh, and then we have this uh, pink hyaline material here with some intervening admixed uh, plasma cells uh, in the stroma. So uh, with this uh, pattern of uh, finding, uh, one should think about potentially a scar, uh, but I think also you wanna think about the deposition type of diseases. Uh, and here we can see some more of this uh, type of material here. Uh, and I think you can get an a, a, a appreciation here for how eosinophilic it is, how vasculocentric it is, uh, and how amorphous and acellular this uh, eosinophilic material is. This is not fibrin, uh, but certainly that would be in the differential. So this uh, uh, would lead to consideration of amyloidosis uh, and in the appropriate setting, uh, doing a Congo red stain should uh, light up uh, these uh, areas with uh, congophilia. Uh, and then to verify that this is indeed amyloid uh, rather than fibrin, uh, you would need to do um, polarized light microscopy. Now, many people wonder how you can do that if you don't have uh, polarizing lenses, uh, special expensive lenses for your microscope. But actually there are fairly simple ways that you can do this um, uh, on your microscope without too much uh, difficulty, uh, just by buying a, a 10 or $15 a pair of uh, polarized uh, sunglasses uh, and uh, using those sunglasses to uh, take out, pop out the lens and then inserting that uh, one, one lens in one part of the uh, uh, light path say below your uh, aperture, and then the other on top of the slide. Uh, and then you can rotate those uh, lenses to uh, get the, uh, uh, you know, extinguish the light uh, and therefore see the uh, birefringence uh, that is uh, reflected in the uh, uh, amyloid, uh, forming a, a sort of a, a greenish color uh, rather than an orange or a reddish color. So uh, that's the cheap man's uh, uh, polarized light microscopy. Of course, uh, you may get a little bit more robust results with uh, more expensive lenses, uh, but uh, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, highly uh, expensive. Okay, well, let's, uh, here's a, actually another example of a similar process, uh, just for comparison's sake. Uh, this, I believe, uh, occurring uh, a little bit lower into the GI tract and actually resembling more of a polyp, uh, but again, having this uh, very amorphous uh, pink deposit here uh, in the uh, submucosa in this time, uh, and again, involving vessels, uh, but I think you can see uh, this sort of uh, blob-like uh, eosinophilic material with a few intervening uh, cells, sometimes plasma cells, and uh, particularly prominent around uh, vessel walls uh, in uh, this situation. Now, this occurred in conjunction with a lymphoid aggregate, uh, but uh, not always is uh, that uh, necessarily the, the case. So two examples of intestinal amyloid uh, amyloidosis uh, for your study. And of course, you can come back and uh, review these slides. The link will be in the uh, description of our uh, video and of course was also in the uh, notice uh, for this uh, uh, release. So here is uh, the uh, next case. And I think we can see here that we have uh, some squamous mucosa as well as uh, some uh, glandular mucosa here. Uh, and we might wonder, is this uh, esophagogastric uh, area or are we in the anorectal uh, junction? Um, so uh, this is, uh, in fact, uh, an area of uh, the anorectal junction. Uh, 
Uh, but uh, those two sites we would want to consider. Now, what do we see here? Um, we see the squamous mucosa and we see a mild degree of inflammation, maybe a little bit of glandular distortion. And then we can see some sort of pale areas here, even at low magnification. Uh, I think you can appreciate that there are some of these uh, uh, changes. So we'll go and take a look at uh, this uh, fragment here. Uh, and we have uh, generally uh, you know, parallel glands. This is a little bit more inflamed than we would usually see in the uh, uh, anorectal area. Uh, and as we come into higher magnification, we see that there's some separation between the muscularis mucosa and these glands. Uh, we're also seeing maybe a few uh, paneth cells. And then of course, you're, you've all tuned in right away to these uh, clustered histiocytes with uh, surrounding lymphoid uh, inflammation some uh, eosinophils and so forth associated with that, that would be characteristic of a, uh, a granuloma. So uh, finding a granuloma uh, and actually finding multiple granulomas here uh, raises the differential for granulomas in the uh, GI tract. <clears throat> and that would include uh, things like, uh, obviously granulomatous infectious agents, um, various fungal or other uh, granuloma forming agents. And particularly in the, uh, the ileal and ileocecal area, this is a, a, a long time standard area where you can find uh, mycobacteria tuberculosis uh, in its most endemic forms, uh, but also brucellosis and other uh, granuloma forming uh, organisms can occur there. Uh, in the anorectal area, you know, you might be concerned about uh, foreign body material. Maybe there's been some injection or some uh, aberrant uh, uh, sexual practice or something of that sort. Um, but I think we'd also need to include uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, the other differential uh, with, uh, you know, pericrypt granulomas of this sort is just a pure crypt granuloma where the gland has ruptured and you've got sort of a mucinous uh, inflammatory response. But here we're seeing, again, note this shortening of the uh, glands, a uh, little bit of uh, granuloma formation and a uh, moderate uh, degree of uh, inflammation uh, with uh, you know, maybe a little bit of exaggeration that we could imagine that there's some distortion of the glandular architecture as well. So this would raise consideration of inflammatory bowel disease and most commonly in the presence of granulomas, uh, that would mean uh, Crohn's disease. Now we see other areas where we don't have too much distortion and where the glands come right down to the uh, base of the, uh, to the touch the muscularis mucosa. And then here, another situation where we have uh, a granuloma in between uh, these areas. So all of those possibilities would uh, be uh, worth considering. And uh, if this were the uh, exclusive biopsy and there were no other history, uh, you would want to exclude inf uh, infectious uh, etiologies before you made the diagnosis of uh, intestinal or anorectal Crohn's disease. Uh, correlation with the endoscopic findings, of course, is uh, very important, uh, but um, I think this is a nice example of uh, being able to sort of pick out those granulomas at low magnification, uh, which is, uh, I think, a very uh, valuable skill to develop. Uh, and so uh, training your eyes to see those uh, variants in the architecture and what you expect to find uh, in your sections at low magnification, sort of scanning power like this is a very uh, valuable skill. So I've covered a couple of common dis disorders uh, and so forth. Um, let's uh, come on to another uh, relatively uh, common situation uh, where you have uh, Again, uh, kind of a bluish pattern and some degree of uh, distortion here to the glands. There's variable size and shape. You see a little bit of uh, uh, maybe, again, shortening here, a separation between the base of the crypt and the muscularis. Um, and uh, it seems to be uh, pretty well involving all of the uh, fragments here. Uh, notice here also we see a degree of uh, prominence and, uh, if you will, a degree of thickening of the muscularis mucosa. Uh, 
So this is a fairly characteristic uh, response in some circumstances to um, inflammatory bowel disease. It can be seen either with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Uh, and at times, this thickening of the muscularis mucosa can become quite prominent, uh, even up to the, the, the point of being uh, nearly a centimeter uh, in thickness. <clears throat> So uh, the features for chronic colitis, uh, the features that you're looking for for active chronic colitis are, of course, the usual crypt abscesses and crypt destruction and so forth. Here we don't see a lot of crypt abscesses, but we certainly do see uh, some degree of, uh, you know, glandular distortion and shortening we've mentioned. Maybe a weak attempt here at a histiocyte, or excuse me, at a granuloma here, like we saw in the previous slides. Um, another one over here, um, but without a good correlation and, and so forth, you might have difficulty ascertaining whether this is um, a uh, Crohn's disease case uh, with a more uh, extensive involvement or whether we're just dealing with ulcerative colitis with some pericrypt abscesses. Um, and so uh, the diagnosis of simply uh, chronic colitis, uh, plus or minus some degree of activity or active inflammation would be appropriate. Uh, now for grading uh, uh, and evaluating this and sort of providing some sort of clinical continuity, uh, various uh, scoring systems have been uh, advocated uh, we use the GEBOES, uh, G-E-B-O-E-S, uh, scoring system in our institution to provide some degree of uh, inter-observer comparability. Uh, and that's a, a system that's uh, been modified in various degrees, and it scores essentially based on inflammation, architecture, um, and uh, ulceration, uh, other factors of that sort uh, in terms of providing a, an evaluation for the degree. Uh, of uh, activity and sort of staging and so forth, which is probably more reproducible than just saying, you know, mildly uh, uh, active chronic colitis or whatever, or just giving a description. But I think uh, uh, in any event, uh, providing some description of the features you find, you know, gland shortening, some slight architectural distortion, uh, increased chronic inflammation without crypt abscesses or ulceration, and the secondary changes uh, in terms of um, um, a hypertrophy of the muscularis mucosa would all be pertinent things to describe and potentially include in your reporting of uh, a case like this. So going on to the next case, uh, here we can see uh, some nice uh, uh, small, or small uh, bowel biopsies. We'll take a look here at uh, what we're uh, uh, trying to find here. And uh, of course, I oftentimes forget what we're looking at uh, at the same time as I'm looking at things, but you may begin to catch a theme here. Here we can begin to see some uh, bluish uh, blobs here. Here's some holes over here uh, and other things here. So uh, I'm beginning to wonder if we've got uh, either a parasite or something that's calcified uh, in this. I don't see a lot of uh, distortion here. Uh, of the architecture, but there is some inflammation here in uh, association with some of these areas. Um, I can see here now that we are in the stomach, we've got oxyntic type mucosa, so we might wonder, is this another example of uh, atrophic gastritis uh, that's coming along here? Uh, I don't see intestinal metaplasia, but what are these uh, structures here? Well, um, they look uh, to be sort of calcified, and to have a rim of uh, histiocytes. Here we can see some multinucleate cells. So probably these are uh, granulomas with calcifications or shaman's bodies associated with them. Here again, we can see a little peripheral rim of uh, um, multinucleate giant cells. So uh, in addition to uh, Crohn's disease, uh, which can provide uh, inflammatory changes and uh, granuloma formation, uh, there are other granulomatous diseases, including sarcoidosis, uh, that can uh, involve the bowel uh, and would be considered in the differential diagnostic uh, consideration in this situation. 
Uh, here we can see uh, what maybe you might wonder, are these uh, goblet cells here? They've got sort of a rounded, expanded mucin droplet. Uh, but we're not seeing the uh, characteristic uh, bluish coloration or mucin change, except maybe here. Uh, so we do have a little focus here of uh, intestinal metaplasia uh, with this slight bluish uh, tinge. And of course, if you're in doubt as to whether this is uh, intestinal type mucin or just a uh, uh, pseudo goblet type cell that we often see at the GE junction in, in Barrett's, um, you can do the uh, Alshin blue stain to see at the appropriate pH to verify that this is um, uh, intestinal type mucin rather than just a, a neutral uh, pH uh, mucin. So this patient did uh, turn out to have uh, sarcoidosis. Um, and uh, here we can see how that looks uh, when it involves uh, the gastric mucosa uh, with the formation of multiple um, uh, calcifying granulomata, uh, so-called Shalman's bodies and so forth, and an associated chronic gastritis. So it's uh, a bit unusual to find uh, sarcoidosis in uh, the, uh, the gastrointestinal mucosa, uh, and uh, certainly as a potential cause for intestinal metaplasia, uh, that's uh, very unusual as well. Uh, but uh, it may be that the chronic inflammatory changes that have been set up here have created conditions for uh, the uh, continuance. Alternatively, uh, we would want to rule out uh, Helicobacter as a driving force for this as well. Uh, we don't see uh, much in the way of active inflammation, but certainly we do see some foveal or hyperplasia here as, uh, as well. So some very interesting considerations there in terms of granulomas and what our differential diagnosis might be uh, when we encounter granulomas uh, in the GI tract. Now, this is to show you a little bit more full-blown example of uh, Crohn's disease. Uh, because the, the granulomas are not always uh, exclusively in the mucosa. In fact, perhaps they're more frequently identified uh, in the uh, deeper uh, inflammatory areas in the, uh, the transmural inflammatory uh, process. Uh, but here, in fact, we're not seeing them. We're just seeing this uh, clustered lymphocytes and aggregates of lymphocytes uh, that extend through the wall. Um, but we do see other features of uh, Crohn's disease here, which includes this sort of uh, fissuring ulceration where the ulcer extends down to the muscularis propria. Um, and that's a very highly uh, um, <clears throat> indicative uh, finding in Crohn's disease uh, to find that kind of uh, uh, fissuring uh, and ulceration. We also can appreciate here um, that there is a uh, uh, distortion and variability in the glandular architecture. Uh, and we might uh, even wonder and say, gee, are we uh, here in the uh, uh, small bowel? Because we have a very villous uh, pattern to the mucosa here as well. And that uh, may well be uh, that this is uh, from the uh, uh, small bowel uh, that has uh, not been well fixed. And we've got some residual villi here uh, as well. Uh, I think, again, you can see to some degree this uh, hypertrophy of the uh, muscularis mucosa. Uh, as you can see, you've got a very indistinct uh, boundary between the uh, uh, deep uh, glandular crypts and so forth, and where you begin with the muscularis propria. And in fact, all of this area appears to have a very uh, enhanced uh, a hypertrophic uh, smooth muscle character to it uh, that makes it difficult to distinguish from the muscularis propria. Well, uh, let's go on to some uh, additional uh, cases here um, that we might uh, encounter and that come into the differential considerations uh, in uh, various, uh, uh, the presence of various histiocytic type of uh, cells. So here are some uh, biopsies uh, that, uh, again, look to be small bowel. Uh, we can see some villi here and uh, see the uh, associations here. Um, we can uh, come into higher magnification on this uh, and begin to see that uh, here we have 
uh, a couple of features of note. We see these clear spaces here uh, in the mucosa. And uh, this uh, is an important artifact to recognize. Uh, this is not uh, uh, fatty uh, deposits that have been washed out with processing. This is so-called pseudolipomatosis, where we get uh, small, clear uh, spaces of varying size in the mucosa, secondary to uh, the insufflation with air during the uh, endoscopic uh, process. Uh, so that produces the uh, little micro injections of air into the mucosa that then uh, give you this appearance of uh, being sort of fatty appearing. But what we do see here, uh, as you may have noticed here, is some uh, pale bluish gray cells uh, here in the mucosa uh, and in the deeper portions of the uh, mucosa that don't belong here. Uh, and here we can see more up into the mucosa. Uh, if we come back at the little lower magnification, uh, we'll see that we've got some of these up in the uh, villi. And uh, sort of honing in on higher magnification, I think you can appreciate that these cells have uh, this uh, most fairly bland nuclei um, and uh, this slightly grayish uh, cytoplasm. Uh, it's not particularly vacuolated in all of the areas, but I think you can see in some of these areas, it's sort of a, a, a histiocytic infiltrate. Uh, these are not uh, really forming uh, granulomas, uh, but they're just more of a diffuse pattern of infiltration. Uh, now this uh, represents um, the uh, accumulation of histiocytes in the lumen, or excuse me, in the uh, lamina propria. And when we see that, our differential should include a number of things. So uh, that would be Whipple's disease, uh, secondary to the uh, organism, Trifonema whippoli, uh, a uh, pseudoxanthoma uh, or a xanthelasma type of lesion due to the uh, accumulation of uh, lipids, uh, or other uh, inflammatory or infectious uh, etiologies, including uh, mycobacteria and so forth. So to, to give you a, an example, a, sort of a, a picture of that, um, I took this uh, photograph uh, from uh, uh, a similar case, uh, and this is using the uh, PAS stain, uh, which is a histochemical stain that will, as you see here, highlight the goblet cells, so intestinal type mucins, uh, not the... Uh, um, a regular, uh, you know, columnar cells, but highlighting these goblet cells, but also lights up very strongly here in these uh, lamina propria histiocytes. Um, and in fact, this is because the histiocyte cytoplasm is engorged with the microorganisms. Um, you can uh, demonstrate these also with uh, specific immunohistochemical re reagents, as well as with some other micro microorganism uh, stains, but the PAS stain is uh, generally considered the uh, most uh, useful and uh, fruitful of these. So a nice demonstration of the uh, uh, Trifonema whippoli organisms in uh, Whipple's disease. And that was in fact what our case was uh, illustrating. Now here's a, another uh, example, another sort of similar problem where uh, we've got an array of uh, infiltrating cells, which you, I think you could appreciate at low magnification. Uh, and again, these have this sort of uh, bluish gray cytoplasm, um, bland nuclei. These are not neoplastic cells. Um, and uh, this sort of you know grayish cytoplasm that uh, doesn't seem to be doing very much um, and involves the the extending, you know, compressing some of the glands, uh, extending out into the uh, uh, villus uh, areas uh, in this uh, sample um, <clears throat> and gives us the uh, appearance of uh, an infiltrative process. So uh, in this situation, of course, uh, this sort of a pattern of infiltration with sort of atrophy associated with these glands uh, might lead you to consider possible neoplasia, uh, signet ring cell neoplasms or other poorly cohesive neoplasms uh, could be uh, presenting in this manner. Uh, but as we've indicated before, uh, 
you also want to rule out uh, infection. So in this uh, particular case, I believe I've included the appropriate uh, uh, histochemical stain here. Uh, this is uh, from a similar case, not from the exact same uh, block, obviously. Uh, but uh, this is an acid fast stain. Um, and as you can begin to appreciate here, uh, in a few areas, we have these similar clustered cells uh, in the lamina propria. Obviously, this is from the colon uh, rather than the uh, small bowel, as our previous case was. And here you can see, again, these uh, histiocytes engorged with multiple microorganisms uh, that, in this case, are acid fast uh, rather than PAS positive. Uh, and therefore, this would be most consistent with a mycobacteria. Um, and in the uh, intestinal tract, uh, in this pattern of inflammation, most commonly, uh, this is Mycobacterium avium intracellulare complex, uh, particularly if you have a history of immunocompromise, uh, HIV, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so a, a nice illustration of the uh, uh, immunohistochemical findings, or excuse me, the histochemical findings associated with uh, Mycobacteria avium intracellulare. Uh, and so both of those uh, slide from the small bowel and here in the colon uh, were representative of uh, that process. Now you can see here how in some circumstances you might easily miss this. Um, and so uh, in some situations, people have uh, advocated routinely doing these stains in the appropriate clinical setting, uh, even to the point where the clinicians will feel like they know more than the pathologist and say, you know, do this stain, do that stain sort of thing without having ever seen the slide. Um, I always say that if you think about it, you should do it uh, because there are circumstances where it may be subtle. Uh, and you may have not gotten the best representative uh, sample, uh, but you might still be able to detect, uh, for example, a small focus like this uh, that you might have otherwise missed uh, histologically. So if you think about doing it, do the stain. All right, well, let's come on to another uh, situation here. Uh, where we have histiocytes, just for comparison and contrasting it. Uh, this is a gastric biopsy, um, and uh, the patient was not immunocompromised. And the endoscopist saw these uh, slightly uh, yellowish uh, flicked areas in the uh, superficial mucosa. And uh, here we see, uh, if you sense the theme here of what we're doing uh, today, you'll see that we have... Uh, some clustered histiocytes uh, that are present in the lamina propria uh, of the uh, gastric mucosa. Uh, these are not the normal uh, cells that we expect to see in the lamina propria, where we expect to see, you know, a few uh, stromal cells, maybe a few inflammatory cells, lymphocytes, and so forth, uh, but not these uh, pale cells. Now, if we were to do the uh, PAS stain and do our acid fast stain, these would uh, not stain, these would be negative. Uh, because this is a situation that is uh, uh, actually fairly more common in the stomach than certainly anywhere else. Uh, and this is a, 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 an accumulation of lipids. Uh, this is a gastric uh, xanthoma or xanthelasma. Uh, and it may be seen in some patients who have, uh, you know, lipid met metabolic disorders, uh, or it may be seen uh, in uh, some uh, sporadic cases. Uh, but certainly if the patient has cutaneous uh, xanthomas, little yellow drops on their eyelids or other uh, cutaneous manifestations of uh, xanthomatous disease, uh, finding this in the stomach would not be unexpected. Uh, and perhaps uh, finding it in the stomach might lead one to evaluate for other uh, evidence of, of uh, the, uh, lipid storage disease disorders. So an example of a gastric xanthelasma or xanthoma. Well, uh, Let's go on to uh, another uh, disorder, um, another case. Here we see uh, 
small biopsy. And we've got a little bit of uh, you know, gel foam material that was used to sort of stabilize the lesion. Uh, it's not clear right off where this is coming from. It may be uh, gastric. Uh, it may be uh, elsewhere. Uh, we do have uh, some sort of uh, maybe a gastric type uh, glandular tissue here. So this could be from the gastric antrum. Uh, and then we see some inflammatory uh, cells here on the surface. Certainly this looks like the foveolar epithelium and that would correspond to that. Uh, and then here is, uh, again, some foveolar epithelium and some ulcer debris. And so in this case, the uh, clinician said there was uh, some sort of uh, ulcerative, exudative uh, material. Uh, and so we, we got a little bit of that and we can say, oh, we've got an ulcer here. Um, but as we come into higher magnification, I think you can appreciate that there are all these little uh, ghosty spheroid spaces with a, a slightly refractile wall. Um, and this looks very much like a, a fungal uh, infection uh, or fungal uh, material. Um, typically, we would use a you know PAS fungal or a, a GMS stain to characterize these. But I think even at this uh, with this H and E stain, you can appreciate uh, that uh, these have uh, some little fruiting like areas. Uh, and the the cells are rather um, enlarged and uh, not typical of usual uh, candida. Uh, so any of the other dimorphic uh, fungi uh, could be considered here, uh, particularly if a, a patient is uh, immunocompromised. Um, but uh, uh, aspergillus or uh, a it's a relative uh, uh, mucormycosis or zygomyces uh, might be considered in this situation, in this pattern where you're getting a essentially a little fungal ball here with uh, some evidence of a dimorphic uh, differentiation uh, and uh, other features. We don't see any uh, uh, septate uh, hyphae in this situation to suggest or support uh, uh, aspergillus, but uh, the uh, GMS stain would be more uh, uh, suited for definitively defining whether this was a mucor or an, an aspergillus with uh, internal uh, septi. Of course, a microbiologic study would be another route to uh, further speciate this. But very often uh, now, especially uh, the uh, histologist with the adjunctive stains uh, does need to make this distinction as there are beginning to be some therapeutic differences in the management of some of these uh, dimorphic uh, fungal uh, disorders. And of course, the history here could be helpful if this is a patient who's had uh, immunocompromise or has, has been uh, uh, treated or has uh, invasive fungal disease elsewhere or even potentially a uh, intrasinusoidal sinus uh, disease uh, with uh, potential extension or spread uh, in the GI tract, that would be pertinent to history. All right. Well, here is something that looks uh, very inflammatory. Could this be uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, or is this uh, something else? Well, you probably figured out that I've shown you inflammatory bowel disease, so I'm probably going in another direction, uh, and indeed uh, that is the case. Uh, so uh, we do see though here uh, the uh, distorted architecture, a dense uh, inflammatory uh, infiltrate, some ulceration. These are all features that might make us think about inflammatory bowel disease um, or idiopathic inflammatory bowel disease. Yes, this is an inflammatory bowel disease. It's just not the idiopathic, uh, chronic uh, uh, type of uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So we're seeing some areas of ulceration, dense uh, lymphoid inflammation. Uh, and as we uh, come into a little bit higher magnification, uh, I think you can begin to appreciate uh, that uh, 
yes, we also have uh, some uh, structures here that look a little bit uh, suspicious uh, for a uh, uh, fungal uh, disorder. So we see here this nice clear space surrounding a central lumen of, or central uh, eosinophilic material here, some more here, some more here. Uh, this uh, is beginning to look like a uh, uh, coccidioidal type of uh, disorder uh, where you might think about the coccidio coccidioidal mycosis or paracoccidial mycosis. Uh, as possible uh, options or possible concerns in this uh, situation. Now, again, uh, your uh, special histochemical stains would be uh, useful in uh, defining these. Um, uh, with uh, coccidial uh, disease, sometimes the mucicarmine stain can also be effective at identifying uh, that uh, microorganism uh, and uh, uh, defining it. Uh, in terms of differentiation, uh, in terms of uh, differentiating coccidioidal mycosis from paracoccidial uh, disease, uh, that's not necessarily something you can do easily on um, <clears throat> uh, histochemical stains uh, and may require uh, culture uh, to uh, reliably distinguish those. Uh, I think the uh, fellow who sent me this slide or provided this slide uh, indicated that it was a paracoccidioidal mycosis. So uh, another thing in the differential for uh, inflammatory lesions in the bowel will obviously be uh, fungal disorders. Here's another uh, GI lesion. We'll continue on with this uh, theme. Uh, again, we've got uh, some uh, uh, gel foam here that's been used to provide stability for the sample. Uh, and as we look at uh, our tissue, uh, we can see there's some inflammation. Uh, it looks like we're in the uh, small bowel. So we've got nice villous uh, structures. And so we, in the small bowel, we would discount the amount of inflammation uh, to some degree, but I think we can see here, there's uh, inflammation with a degree of uh, accompanying histiocytic uh, type inflammation or, or pattern uh, where there's more cytoplasm here. And so uh, neoplasia might come into consideration here. You can see how some of these cells might be uh, considered as possible uh, neoplastic uh, cells here. Uh, but we can also see that there's a degree of, of active uh, inflammation. Um, and we see these little blue dots here in some of these cells. Notice these little extra uh, blue materials, which kind of look a little bit like nuclear material, but they're too small. Uh, so you're, we're seeing too many of these blue dots. Uh, and here's a few more of them around here. Uh, and then we've got this ulceration uh, on this uh, lesion. So uh, what are we thinking of here? Well, uh, here we can see, I think in this section, nicely dotted, uh, that we have a few uh, multinucleate giant cells, a little granuloma type of formation as well. Uh, and so we might think about uh, granulomatous diseases uh, that might include this uh, sort of thing. Um, so the blue dots, the granulomatous inflammation, the ulceration, uh, and uh, in this case, a patient who was somewhat immunocompromised uh, raised a concern for uh, histoplasmosis. Uh, and uh, here again, I think we can see some of these nice little blue dots uh, scattered around uh, in some of these uh, histiocytic uh, cells. So uh, histoplasmosis, uh, again, in, an opportunistic uh, infection that can involve the uh, GI tract uh, in several circumstances, has a somewhat subtle uh, appearance at times uh, and may easily be overlooked if you're not thinking about that possibility. Uh, but I think if you, once you start to see these little blue things, then uh, go the next stage, do your stains. Uh, again, a GMS stain would uh, highlight these and identify these as being uh, 
um, not belonging to the uh, inflammatory uh, response. So quite an array of uh, fungal and parasitic diseases here, so to speak. Here's the uh, uh, stain showing you the uh, uh, plethora of these uh, microorganisms and their size. Uh, this was a PAS fungal stain, uh, nicely highlighting the uh, uh, organisms inside uh, the lamina propria in the histiocytes. So histoplasmosis. So we got another case here. Let's see what this one uh, will uh, tell us. Uh, this is uh, um, also uh, a, a biopsy from a uh, uh, colonic uh, site. We see here a, a little degree of uh, glandular disorientation and uh, you know variability, some uh, inflammation down deep here in some of these areas. Here we see some ulcer debris uh, in this uh, fragment here. Um, and uh, we sometimes want to look at that to make sure we aren't uh, overlooking uh, the organisms or the uh, source of this. So ulcers in the uh, GI tract, in the uh, colon, we've talked about the inflammatory bowel disease, idiopathic uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, we've talked about various uh, infections uh, with uh, fungal elements that can cause granulomas and ulceration and so forth. Uh, what is uh, going on here? Well, uh, we are aware that uh, uh, in addition to fungal diseases, there are some parasitic disorders uh, which uh, may uh, result in ulceration. Um, and in fact, uh, this is... Uh, an example of uh, amoebic colitis. Um, and I'm trying to find here a good example here. I think there are a few. There's one right there. You got that guy right there. Caught him take, looking at you. Uh, and there are a few more up here, here, which you can see here. Very slight rounded and a very pale nucleus uh, that you can see here. So don't overlook the... Um, uh, ulcer debris as a potential diagnostic clue. Now, I recall uh, taking my board exams and uh, one of the slides uh, showed the uh, classical flask-shaped ulcer of uh, amoebic colitis uh, with a few uh, recognizable organisms in the tissue. Uh, but uh, that's not always what you're going to see. Is this? I think you would have difficulty defining this as a flask-shaped ulcer. Uh, this is an endoscopic biopsy, uh, and you may not always see in that uh, infiltrate whatever the uh, amoebic organisms. Uh, they may not be present in the tissue, but rather, as in this case, be present in the uh, uh, exudate or the ulcer debris. Uh, and again, let's see if we can find one in this here. So here, I think you can see, again, a few of them here in this mucoid uh, debris uh, shining their eyes back at you. So um, uh, certainly uh, a stool exam for oven parasites might be, uh, might be necessary to make the diagnosis, but occasionally, uh, we can make that a diagnosis uh, on the histology uh, that's provided for us. Because uh, frankly, there are not quite as many uh, truly adept parasitologists out there evaluating stool uh, as there are pathologists evaluating GI biopsies. So I hope that you'll be uh, mindful of this uh, possible uh, diagnosis uh, <clears throat> if uh, it presents in an uncommon uh, circumstance and the patient uh, receives endoscopy rather than a stool uh, for parasites. Okay, well, you're probably wondering what uh, rare things we've are got uh, looking at uh, next. Um, we'll take a look at this next case. Uh, and this is actually another example of amoebiasis, uh, which I included just for uh, completeness sake. Uh, for you to be able to study and see a few additional examples of where you might uh, see the organisms here 
And so what I'm going to suggest is that uh, you take a look at these digital slides and uh, uh, you can use the, uh, the viewer. And uh, right up here at the top, you've got the ability to take a photograph. So uh, I'm going to challenge you to take a look at this and then email me your photograph, your best photograph uh, uh, of the amoebae in this uh, uh, particular case. Um, so we won't uh, spend a lot more time on it at this point, but I'll give you that challenge. And so uh, I hope that you get this far in the video and that you'll uh, take a look at the slide and uh, send me your photo. Here's what they look like uh, under the microscope with, uh, again, a PAS stain. These amoebae will oftentimes have PAS positive cytoplasm. Sometimes they will have engulfed red cells, which uh, should not stain. And so you may get these little uh, uh, vacuoles uh, within the cytoplasm. These are engulfed uh, red cells. This is called Entamoeba histolytica because it has that uh, uh, hemato-phagocytic uh, capability and lysis uh, of cells. So uh, a nice high power magnification view there. Okay, we'll change the uh, change the gears here for a few minutes and uh, wrapping things up here. This is uh, an esophageal biopsy. Uh, and this patient uh, was being evaluated uh, for, I think, some you know epigastric pain and so forth. Um, and this uh, uh, esophagus had the appearance of having sort of a white exudative uh, period, a picture, or sort of a plaque-like pattern. Looked a little bit like it might have been Canada esophagitis, or so-called uh, thrush. You know, you see the oral thrush uh, uh, that can sometimes involve the uh, esophagus. Uh, but instead, what we're seeing here is not any evidence of a uh, uh, yeast infection. We're seeing this rather uh, peculiar distinction with uh, an area or a band of uh, sort of uh, pale cells, perikeratotic type appearance that's sort of uh, falling off the, the surface um, and sort of easily separating from the surface. Uh, and in fact, the endoscopist noted that this uh, did separate from the uh, uh, underlying mucosa fairly easily. Uh, so this is an example of so-called sloughing esophagitis. It's really not an inflammatory uh, process. It's more of a uh, uh, an idiopathic uh, situation that uh, just it leads to um, you know dissolution or a uh, a, a uh, premature death, if you will, of these superficial uh, keratinocytes that then readily uh, sort of uh, slide off or exfoliate into the to the lumen. Uh, there's not any particular pathology that's uh, associated with this in terms of adverse uh, associations or otherwise. It's just a nice thing to be aware of and to correlate with the clinical findings uh, and to help them to uh, avoid assuming that it's candida or assuming that it's a, a chemical burn or something of uh, that sort. So a nice uh, example uh, and something that may be a little bit subtle in some circumstances. Um, this, uh, for contrast, is an example of uh, candida esophagitis, which could be easily uh, mistaken, as we have mentioned. Um, and typically, candida esophagitis is associated with uh, areas of ulceration. There may be pre-existing uh, herpetic infection. Um, and uh, you get this uh, exudative uh, appearance uh, where um, the yeast-like forms will begin to bud and uh, extend their um, branches down into uh, the um, dying uh, squames. And so here we can see a little bit of that. And I think right here you can appreciate that there is this uh, vertical uh, pattern. This is the budding yeast extending its uh, sort of bud down into uh, the uh, dying keratinocytes. There are other uh, yeast forms in here as well, which would light up quite nicely with the uh, uh, PAS stain. Uh, we can see a few more in here um, as well. Mm, right in here, I believe. 
Uh, though these can be mistaken with uh, nuclei and so forth, so it, it is good to do the stain. Typically, you do not find them actually in the ulcer itself uh, because uh, here we've gotten down, we've debrided off the, the dead tissue and we have viable granulation tissue, which is not a suitable uh, substrate for the uh, yeast uh, to, uh, to take root in. So those uh, two examples, I think things that can be confused clinically uh, certainly not uh, morphologically, we don't, don't think of that, but from a clinician standpoint, they could be thinking yeast uh, versus sloughing esophagitis. So we've got uh, enough time here for one last case here. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a nice example of uh, uh, chemical gastropathy, uh, about as good an example of the type of uh, reactive uh, changes you should see. Uh, let's get this around a little bit better. So uh, reactive gastropathy or chemical gastropathy is associated with foveal or hyperplasia. Um, and uh, at the far extreme example, this takes on a very uh, serrated uh, pattern or what's been called a corkscrew appearance. Um, but in the colon, we would call this a serrated pattern. So I'll use that term here. Uh, it's an undulation of this hyperplastic foveolar epithelium. It goes up and down. And so it has this serrated or uh, hyperplastic appearance. Now, the other feature of reactive chemical gastropathy is uh, associated with this irritation to the surface, and that is a perpendicular metaplasia uh, in this lamina propria that produces smooth muscle fibers. And here you can see several of them quite nicely uh, scattered in between the uh, oxyntic glands uh, and extending up into the uh, very surface. Now, reactive gastropathy is not a uh, uh, it's not a serious disease, but it's an indication of uh, chronic irritation in the stomach that may be due to a variety of possible factors. Those things have been identified. They include, of course, the very ubiquitous uh, presence of uh, frequent alcohol or bile reflux or uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, uh, among others. Uh, these can all lead to this uh, reactive gastropathy appearance um, and uh, uh, eventually to some degree or some uh, other permanent uh, damage to, to the uh, uh, mucosa. So uh, I think with that, we're going to uh, uh, wrap up the cases and thank you for uh, joining me uh, today. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be with you. I hope these cases will be uh, useful to you, uh, both for the compare and contrast and I do look forward to getting your photographs of uh, the uh, Entamoeba histolytica. So uh, until next time, thanks so much for joining me. And uh, we will uh, see you in November for Sign Out with the Professor, uh, where we hope to have a guest professor uh, join us for that session. So until then, have a great day.